Thank you all for coming out. I want to start by um, thanking the Wallace Foundation and the American Alliance of Museums for presenting and sponsoring today's talk. Um, we'll hear from Wallace, but they've been engaged in a multi-year audience building initiative, and which includes a, a great partnership with the American Alliance of Museums. Um, so there'll be some publications and um, some videoing that's uh, part of this as well. Um, my name is Chris Taylor. I am the current director of the Pilchuck Glass School in Seattle, Washington. My bio in the forms might say the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. That's how I got connected with the Wallace Foundation with some of our work during the Wallace Excellence Awards. Um, but I've since, uh, in three weeks ago, is anyone else three weeks on the job running <laughs> and moderating a panel? <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, today, you know, I went and sat and saw Eric uh, Huggins talk. Most of you, I'm sure, were, were at this, um, which I think brings our topic into a, an interesting, sharper focus that building millennial audience is not just about grabbing a market share of people in their, their leisure time, but really a commitment to telling stories, to being visible, to being seen. And I think really it all boils down to mission. Are we succeeding in bringing our mission to people? So I think that's a, a great way to set the table and Erica did a wonderful job. Um, so we have three panelists today. You'll see their bio in your book and in your app. Uh, Christine Yoon will be speaking to us from the Wallace Foundation. As I mentioned, they're deeply committed to access and the arts and audience building of multi-year sustainability. And Wall Wallace, again, they don't just fund, which is great. We love our funders. Uh, but they then commit to strategic funding, to research, and then disseminating that research. So if you haven't visited their website, please do yourself the favor and go check out the multiple free resources available there. Uh, we'll hear from Mariana Shepard, who is the Associate Director of Public Programs at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans, and we'll be there next year. We're already planning on having a good time in New Orleans. Um, and we'll hear from Rand Suffolk, who's the um, Director of the High Museum of Art. And I was there about a year ago, and they're definitely doing some great work on inclusion and collaboration. So I think we're in for a really good panel. Before I start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it over to Christine in a moment, but I, we have our, our volunteer in the audience, Jennifer, right? Who is, um, I just figured if there's anyone here just to help our panelists and to help us, talk about a couple voices, three or four people wanna say why you're here and what you're hoping to learn about millennials, about audience building, anything you can help us focus on. We'll be happy to take a question or two at the beginning or kick it out. First hand, we got one, maybe, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm from Visit Botanical Garden, and we're looking at uh, next generation philanthropy, so moving our current emerging professional program into just a basic membership level to a higher level with more engagement. More engagement from young people, yes, those young dollars. We had one back here too, straight back. And yeah, please use the mic because we're recording and we need voices, thanks. Hi, my name is Kinnerit. I'm from a historical society, and we do really great with engaging people under 10 and over 60. Wow. We're excited to get in those in-betweeners. There's a half century in there, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of room for a lot of room. Another question up here? I'm Lauren with the Mariners Museum in Virginia, and we're actually doing an entire exhibit on the sea is just not into you, um, and the target audience is millennials, and so I'm looking for help with that. Excellent. So, young dollars, anyone between 10 and 60, and uh, some programming ideas. So that'll pepper our, some conversations here. I am gonna turn it over, and I think we're gonna go for, for Christine, then to Mariana, then to Randall, and then we'll do a little uh, sort of talk show style, answer questions, and then we'll rock and roll here from you. So take it away, Christine. Great. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Again, thank you, AAM, for bringing us together here. And I'm really honored and pleased to be up here with Mariana and Rand to talk about millennials. Um, I'd like to start with a quick introduction about my organization. We're a private foundation based in New York City. Our mission is to foster improvements in learning and enrichment for disadvantaged children and the vitality for the arts for everyone. And as Chris very eloquently said, our approach is to help answer a question that 
if solved, could help propel progress in a field. What that means is we fund organizations that allow us to look very deeply into what they're doing and why, so that we can share some of what our organizations are learning from their experience with a broader field, so we can benefit more than those that we can fund directly. And that's part of why I'm here today. I'll be speaking from two initiatives that the Wallace Foundation have funded in the arts. Um, the focus has been on building audiences. The first initiative is the Wallace Excellence Awards, uh, which the Clay Studio actually was a recipient. And we did see evidence for the 46 organizations for whom we have reliable data that they were able to sh achieve audience growth over three years. And that initiative was with both museums and performing arts organizations. And the other initiative that I'll be speaking from is the one that we're currently in, Building Audiences for Sustainability. We're funding 25 performing arts organizations, unfortunately, no museums in there for now, 25 performing arts organizations across the country really looking at this question. So it takes the experience of the Wallace Excellence Awards and then adds in that financial component to it. And I'll be speaking from these three publications. And because this is an intro, I have limited time. I'm going to breeze through them. Um, but everything is available on our website, wallacefoundation.org, and apparently on the tables if you leave us with your survey responses. Um, so the first is The Road to Results, Effective Practices for Building Arts Audiences. And this publication looked at the most successful organizations in our Wallace Excellence Awards. Um, when we took a look at the practices that those most successful organizations did, we saw that there were really nine common themes that came up over and over again in their work. Uh, this infographic is the sum of those nine themes. And again, because I'm breezing through this, um, and I think you have copies to read through um, on, on your time as well, um, really quickly, just to orient yourself, practices one through six are really about looking outward and externally at, at, at the target audience that you want to look for, in this case, millennials. But however you define that target audience that your organization is really trying to build in, um, it starts with recognizing when change is needed. A lot of this has to do with market research as well. Um, and then practices seven, eight, nine are looking more inter internally at your organization and building in a culture of constantly testing and learning and building in that culture of recognizing if you really want to attract a new target audience and you're successful at doing so over time, that will change your organization as well. So planning for that to happen. Um, we talk a lot about the importance and the value of using market research, and at the same time we recognize market research is probably one of the hardest things to get funding for. So again, in practicing what we're preaching, taking out the guesswork, um, I think is an important publication to say that we have out there. This is a practical guide to market research, both if you happen to have the funding to do it, how to contract high quality work if it's your first time going about this, or if you have extremely limited resources, uh, financial resources, but resources, um, how to find uh, time resources amongst your staff if you're able to do market research, some of the market research studies in-house. So I, I think this is actually a really great resource that we have. And then what you're here for today is uh, the report that we also have online, Building Millennial Audiences. This report, again, comes from our current initiative. We're in it right now, so we don't have final lessons to share with you all. Um, but the 25 organizations, they are performing arts organizations that we're funding, got market research uh, tailored and catered to their specific audience segment and their specific questions that they had. So there is some variability across these market research studies. For instance, even the definition of millennial that people used varied a little bit according to their target market. I think that 10 to 60 range is broad. We had one organization that defined it as um, like 19 to 23, which is a little bit random, those four, those four years. So there is some variability, um, but we synthesized, uh, the majority of our organizations are going after younger, organi uh, younger audiences and the millennial population. So we synthesized those market research studies. And I'll run through a sampling of the slides, and again, the full report is available online. And I think the first point is um, we completely recognize millennials are not a monolithic group. There's a lot of uh, variety even within the millennial segment, but they do differ from prior generations in some pretty major ways. And I highlight two ways here. Number one, millennials face more financial challenges. 
So comparing other generations where, when they were in that 18 to 34 age range in the 90s versus uh, 2013, we are seeing that millennials are starting with lower salaries, lower net worth, and with higher student loan debt. Millennials are also more ethnically diverse than any other generation. Um, I would actually, that's a little bit incorrect. More ethnically diverse than any other older generation and think about diversity differently. 43% of millennials are non-white, the highest share of any older generation. Um, and millennials think about ethnicity, uh, diversity beyond just race and ethnicity. Um, it also has to do with social attitudes, religion, sexual orientation. Um, and the full study goes into some of the other ways that millennials are different. Across the market research studies that we funded, um, we kept seeing over and over again some common barriers to attendance among prospects. And that's in quotes because the way an organization defined prospect, there was some variability, but the same reasons kept coming up over and over again. This is the, the complete list, and I think there's a build in here. And this was true regardless of where the organization was located. Again, we're funding across the US. It was true regardless of their budget size um, and also true regardless of the kind of performing art that they offered, whether it was a traditional symphony orchestra or a modern dance company. These same reasons kept coming up. And I'm going to do a deeper dive into just these top three. I think that's all I have time for today. Um, so first, the main barrier that millennials kept saying over and over again was that the cost was too high. And the cost was too high is actually a simplification of a lot of things. So there's the actual cost issue, the cost of the ticket, the cost of the whole evening out, which can include babysitters, um, dinner, et cetera, or even the cost compared to the kind of seat that you get. But underneath that cost is actually um, some broader underlying considerations about value, risk, and trade-offs, and the perceptions around these things. And risk is a really important concept that keeps coming up. Um, this quote here, millennials are willing to spend more freely for rock concerts or special events that they know they'll enjoy, but they won't spend as much for an event that they're not sure, uh, that they're not sure about. So risk is closely tied to familiarity. And what we're seeing in the experience of our organizations is not just familiarity with the art form, it's familiarity with the entire experience. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. Also, this is further proof that when people say the cost is too high, there's a lot more going on underneath there. Um, prospects for several organizations thought tickets cost more than they do. And this chart is an illustration from one particular study where every generation thought that the cost of the ticket was higher than it actually was. And millennials actually thought it was more than two times as much as what it actually was. Um, on the barrier that they didn't have time to go or that they're busy with other things, um, that actually is a reflection of the intense competition for time and spending. Um, and again, across the studies, we saw the same things come up over and over again. And restaurants and bars is in bold because that was the number one um, barrier that we saw, a number one competitive event with the performing arts organizations. When millennials were asked, what other cultural activities do you do? going out to eat was considered a cultural activity. <laughs> um, and then the third barrier was not being familiar with or aware of the organization. And there's a couple of things that have to do with that. The first, more than other generations, millennials like to prepare and consult more sources before a cultural activity. And this is actually based on the Placa Cohen's culture track survey. Um, and I bring back this illustration with familiarity with experience. Um, what we've seen in the example of our current grantees is millennials saying, I am actually interested in that modern dance piece that, that you're showing this season. It's not that modern dance is turning me off. That is interesting to me. But I don't know if I go if I'm going to feel like an idiot. I don't know when I'm supposed to clap. I don't know what I'm supposed to wear. So it is the entire experience that they're unfamiliar with. 
And then the third is awareness of the organization. I think this one's a little painful. It's having a crush on someone and realizing they don't even know you exist. Um, a lot of organizations thought they weren't attracting millennials because they gave off a perception of being stuffy or being unwelcoming to younger generations. And actually, um, when the concept of the organization or the concept of the season was presented in the focus groups, um, millennials or um, whatever the target audience said, Actually, that sounds really cool. I would definitely go to that. I just had no idea this organization existed or no idea this organization existed and offered this kind of programming. On the flip side, some of the things that attract millennials, again, we saw commonalities across all the market research studies about what are those motivators to attendance for the millennial audience. Um, and here's the full list of the key reasons why millennials are attending uh, the performing arts institutions that are currently being funded by Wallace. And you'll see the commonality in here that the reasons for attending reflect deeper desires for personal growth and unusual experiences. And it, again, experience is kind of the common theme through this whole thing. And the slide is labeled takeaways, but it's more if I have time to go into it, these are the things I would uh, probably speak more about. Um, I breezed through that nine effective practices chart. Um, I would say start with a very clear problem statement. Why exactly is your organization going after millennial audiences? Um, for instance, one of the organizations that we're currently funding, they were actually successful in attracting the share of millennial audiences that they wanted in their, uh, in their season, but those millennials were buying cheaper tickets, attending less frequently, and they were not yet donors compared to the other generations they were attracting. So they were losing money in the short term. So that organization had to be very, very clear across the organization, why is it important to go after millennials? Um, the second, market research can help. It can help you get clear on where you are today, and that helps, also helps answer the why and where you want to go. It can test your assumptions on why millennials or your target audience are coming or aren't coming to your organization. Um, and it can also help you measure and get feedback on what you're doing and how things are tracking so that you can adjust things in real time to what's working. And that leads to the last bullet, um, never no, not never, rarely do you go after something new and you're successful the first time. Um, so a lot of what we're encouraging with our grant recipients is to follow this cycle of testing and learning, to test, refine, repeat, because it will take a couple iterations to get to the formula that's right for your organization and your community. Um, and I went through those very quickly, but stay tuned as we're learning more in our current initiative, we'll be publishing those insights online. And again, everything that we've learned from Wallace Excellence Awards with independent evaluators and with research, we're also publishing and we are happy to share as well. And it's my pleasure to turn it over to Marianne, I think is next. Hello everyone, my name is Mariana Shepard and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Public Programs at the Contemporary Arts Center in New Orleans. Um, I'm really happy to be here and um, be able to take this opportunity to engage in dialogue about engaging millennial audiences. Uh, so a little bit about uh, the Contemporary Arts Center, um, also known uh, as the CAC, so you'll hear me refer to it as the CAC. Um, uh, but we are a multidisciplinary arts organization founded um, in 1976 by a group of passionate artists. Um, it began as an artist-driven uh, arts organization, um, really when the, the moment across the country to uh, eradicate the walls between visual and performing arts um, was really active. And so the CAC was really the first of its kind um, in the city of New Orleans. Our building is about 100,000 uh, square feet. Uh, we occupy four floors, two gallery spaces, um, two adjoining warehouses. Um, in fact, our warehouses were um, in the news recently. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this um, star athlete, Serena Williams, had her wedding there. Um, <laughs> but it was actually in our space, so we were really happy to host that wedding there. Um, but we do have um, ample amount of space for performing arts as well as visual arts. Um, 
So for much of CAC's history, our audience has been primarily Caucasian. Um, and so for those of you who have been to our great city of New Orleans, you know that New Orleans is um, a gumbo of ethnicities and backgrounds and cultures. So when setting out to propose a project for the Wallace Initiative, um, as an organization, we thought um, it was very important that our organization represent the city in which we lived and worked. So. Our target audience um, for this initiative is young professionals of African descent, ages 21 to 40, have some college education, arts inclined, um, that live and work, live or work um, in New Orleans for over um, six months out of the year. And we specifically focused on this group um, for two main reasons. One, African Americans represent the majority of the New Orleans population. In fact, they make up 51% of the population of New Orleans. And two, because this audience was drastically underrepresented in our current programs, specifically around performing arts. Um, so in the fall of 2015, Planner Zone marketing research firm came in and um, conducted a qualitative, um, I'm sorry, quantitative research study looking at African-American young professionals in New Orleans to get their impressions of the CAC. Six focus groups were conducted um, and guided through discussions about local arts venues, barriers to engagement, arts entertainment preferences, as well as cultural issues affecting arts engagement and perception. When asked about contemporary art, respondents associated with ideas of upscale, high-end, sophisticated, and avant-garde. In their report, the research firm noted that many participants told them that these associations were not necessarily bad, however, their body languages indicated that there were loaded terms. Um, these terms were usually accompanied with air quotes, um, <laughs> gestures, or accents. So if we were to unpack um, you know, these words a bit, the implication here is that contemporary can be a bit um, unaccessible more intellectually demanding, and perhaps expensive, and tends to appeal to a refined upper class audience, primarily a white audience. So during this time frame, um, the research firm um, helped us to understand the behaviors and attitudes and the barriers to perception for this group. So the, for the purpose of my presentation today, um, I've extrapolated a little bit of key points and takeaways of that feedback um, to hopefully help you in your efforts to engage millennial audiences. So, um, so CAC, we are sort of framing our um, initiative to increase awareness among the target audience with um, these strategic questions. <clears throat> One, can presenting artists of national and local recognition raise awareness and increase ticket sales among the target population? Two, can marketing tactics to encourage word of mouth raise awareness and increase ticket sales among the target population? And three, what is the targeted advertisement and media strategy to better reach the target demographic? And so for each of these, we've um, worked with some, a number of tactics to try to answer these questions. The first one being, can presenting artists of national and local recognition raise awareness and increase ticket sales among the target population? So our target, uh, I'm sorry, our, our tactic for this strategy was to present artists of color. Um, so for example, in our first learning cycles, um, so just a little bit of, of, just to back up a little bit, each year we're, we're looking at um, the season as a learning cycle. So right now we're in our final, final portion of our third learning cycle, but on the onset of this initiative, it was our first learning cycle. We presented Tennessee Williams' The Mutilated, we remounted it with the local cast, um, so responding to the feedback in which our respondents mentioned that they would like to see themselves reflected in the work. So a CAC prior to this initiative would have just remounted Tennessee Williams with a you know, majority white cast. But because of this research, we were able to think more thoughtfully about who is actually on stage to be able to attract that audience. Um, another piece of that is the content. So what, what is it that the artists are saying? So it's not just putting people of color, young people of color on stage, but what are the things that they're exploring in that work? And so we made sure that our curator knew that this was the type of work that needed to be represented on our stages. Um, and just to let you know that season was wildly successful. Um, it was probably one of the most successful seasons throughout these three learning cycles. And I'll also add a caveat to that is that I think that part of that was also because the person selecting those shows also fit into our target demographic. So our curator, young African-American woman, 
And so she's able to speak to that audience but she, because she can speak for that audience. Um, and I like to also think about intentionality too, thinking about what is the intent behind these shows? Like what is the CAC saying when we're presenting specific audiences? So just thinking about that a little bit more. Um, so one of the things that came also out of our market research is thinking about um, word of mouth. How do people know about the organization? What are they saying about the organization? Um, so for those of you have been, who have been to New Orleans, you know that we love a good festival. We love a good festival. Anything you love or like, we have a festival for it. Strawberries, beignets, crawfish. We also have a fried chicken festival. Um, so it was no surprise to us that out of the research came that this target demographic sort of, um, sort of thought about their experience, much like a festival. So if you know what a festival experience is like, it includes variety, novelty, social interaction, food and beverage, music, spontaneity, casual atmosphere, drinks, food. And so we started thinking about all of the programmings that are tied to our performing arts. So thinking about engagement, thinking about the wraparound activities. And I want to spend a little bit of time in this area because this is sort of my focus in the organization, um, thinking about our community, thinking about how do we bring these people into our community. So one of the things that we implemented was Second Thursdays, which is an evening at the museum. So on these nights, we, um, we bring in artists, we bring in community organizations, partners, to really highlight what's happening at the CAC, what's coming up at the CAC. We have a bar on site, we have a food truck on site, we have live entertainment. We really amplify that festival experience, and it's working. Um, it's probably one of the areas that we're seeing major changes in. Um, it's a free night, so anyone who comes in, um, they give us their email, they get in for free. Um, and so it allows us to sort of allow them into our doors without any sort of risk. We're breaking down that perception that this space is actually for you. Um, the people that you see whenever you walk into our space are young people. Um, they look like the community. And so there's this relationship that's already established when they're coming into our doors. Um, another piece to that is that the conversations that are taking place on these evenings are in direct relationship to the content that they want to hear about. So for example, a couple weeks ago, not, not weeks, but a couple months ago, we had a conversation um, around New Orleans celebrating its tricentennial. So what does this, the next 300 years of New Orleans look like? So we invited young people, we invited community organizations. These nights are really about the community. So we ourselves aren't really visible. So it's not really us on the mic. This is who we are, we're CAC, you should love us. We're really allowing the community to utilize our space and create those, um, those bridges for interaction and engagement. Um, so again, thinking about what personal relevance means. Um, for, for nearly everyone in our focus groups, <clears throat> it was important that, um, that culture be represented, that thinking about their experience being unique was also um, thought about. So when people come to the CAC, every experience is very different because every performance is different, every exhibition is different. So of course, all of the engagement activities shouldn't sort of be the same experience time and time again. So we really make an effort to really um, amplify that idea of difference and unique. And every time you come here, it's not gonna be like the last time you came here. So there's this, um, this idea of spontaneity and surprise, which then goes back to what we, we found out during our, our, our focus groups. Um, so as you can see, these are some great photos of people enjoying themselves at the CAC. Um, so these nights have really become um, wildly successful, as I mentioned before. And it's really having reverberations around the organization. I'll speak a little bit about the institutional impact in a, in a minute. Um, so our other tactic to encourage word of mouth is we've um, invited a group of about 20 or so community leaders, tastemakers, um, social influencers, that's the new buzzword, social influencers, um, to really act as an internal focus group for us. So these are people who are around the city who are arts inclined, who really fit our target demo or have relationships to our target demo that can inform us in real time about what it is that we're doing right. 
what it is that we're doing wrong and how can we make course corrections in the moment. So we meet with them bi-monthly. Um, we offer them tickets to the performances. Um, we give them surveys. <laughs> um, and then they tell us, you know what? When I went to the CAC, the front desk person, they weren't, that really, they, weren't that re they weren't friendly with me. The performance, I feel like, you know, we could have used an intermission. Um, I don't think that this artist was the appropriate artist to present this particular work. So all the things that they're telling us, we're able to actually speak to, we're able to talk to, we're able to continue to dialogue, and this idea of constantly making changes so that we're, we're breaking down those barriers to perception. And in the community, they act as ambassadors for our programs. So we offer them discount codes, we offer them um, a complimentary membership with their um, time served on the, on the committee. Their commitment is a year. Um, and so it's a really, really strong group of people and a really great trade-off for us. And it's an area that we feel can have sustainability well beyond the initiative is over. And then the other area um, that we've been testing is around our marketing tactics. And this is the area that we're not quite there yet. We're still working in this area. It's, it's still rough around the edges. Um, so while, you know, we're constantly building our online presence, um, the engagement isn't there quite yet. So we post all the time. This is what we're doing. This is what we have coming up. But we're not really asking the community, what do you want from us? So like trying to continue the conversation well, after the experience is over. And so as we go into this fourth learning cycle, this is an area of focus for the organization, is how can we engage this group online? So research shows us that they're heavy users of social media, primarily Twitter, black Twitter, <laughs> um, Instagram, Facebook. And so that's the area, like I mentioned, we're really trying to hone in on. Um, with regard to, to this initiative. And then the institutional impact. Um, so thinking about how this initiative is primarily focused in the performing arts, it actually has um, implications and has impacted the organization as a whole. So our visual arts programming, although we do curate our shows about two to three years out, our curator is thinking about this demographic as they think about those shows. So. Um, you know, next year we're bringing in Micheline Thomas. Um, and so this is someone who is, um, has a, a huge following within our target demographic. And that decision was due to this research. So how do we continue to expand this engagement far beyond the performing arts? Because like I mentioned, we're multidisciplinary. So it's really having some um, effects there our youth programs as well. So they're taking the format of our second Thursday. So the teen program, they have their sort of night out at the museum <clears throat> with food trucks, not a bar. Um, <laughs> um, and then they actually have a panel conversation on, uh, what is today, Tuesday? Thursday, Sorry, this is our uh, last second Thursday for the season. So the teen program is sort of taking that same shift and it's also being diversified in that way. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, intentionality. So whenever we're thinking about, for example, event rentals, you know, what does that rental look like to the, to the community? Because for them, it's all one CAC, you know, whether it's a paid rental or not, you know, what does that mean? So the fact that we had Serena Williams in our space, that was kind of hot, you know what I mean? And so that again continues to make, make CAC relevant, make it hip, make it fresh. Um, and then our board and staff has been diverse. So our AAC, our Audience Advisory Committee, has also acted as a pipeline to our board. So we have currently three of our past AAC members who are on our board now. So we have that perspective being represented on our board as well as our staff. So we're thinking about what does the curative performing arts look like? What, what does the director of our marketing look like? So again, the impact has been very far. Um, so thank you again for your time and I will pass it on to Rand. Okay, well thank you. Uh, 
I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the High Museum of Art and our efforts over the course of the past couple years to really change ourselves in an effort to become a much more vital magnet within our community to really, hopefully, encourage the broadest possible public engagement with the museum. And for us, I'm going to provide a little context first, and that's this. Uh, at the High, we talk a lot about this, and we refer to this as the mantra of our DNA. Growth, inclusivity, collaboration, and connectivity. We want this to be our collective conscience. We want this to be the white noise of our existence, the stuff that informs all the decisions we make or the actions that we take as an organization. Uh, it's really exciting for us to see how our staff interprets this, and uh, a lot of good things have come from it. Uh, but we're, we're really relentless in pursuing this, increasingly so. And so it's been very exciting to see how our efforts to recalibrate our relationship with the community have, have become increasingly fruitful. So with that as context, I want to shift gears now and talk about five things that I think uh, the High has been working very hard on to kind of put ourselves on the radar of that young professional or millennial uh, audience. The first of which is um, authenticity. Uh, you know, we all are striving to find authenticity in this, day, in this incredible digital age. Uh, and for an art museum like the High, we tend to do that via engagement with complex visual culture. You know, we want to present the finest examples of artistic achievement that we can get our hands on and present that to our audience every single day. The flip side of that is that while the High has always, I think, had an extraordinary reputation when it comes to delivering great exhibitions, where I think we've turned a corner and where I think we've really raised the bars in terms of the diversity of content that we're presenting as well. Uh, if we're gonna talk the talk, we gotta walk the walk. And this shows you 24 exhibitions, really the, the, the featured exhibitions that we've done at the museum in the last two years alone, and more than half. 14 out of the 24 uh, highlight important work by artists of color, women artists, and gay artists. Um, you know, this is one of the most tangible aspects of our mission, and if we're, if we're really committed to being a place where uh, all of Atlanta is comfortable coming together, if we're really committed to being a place where you can come and see yourself reflected in your institution, uh, then we believe it has to start there. Uh, the second thing is, and you're gonna hear some echoes uh, in my presentation from what you've heard before, uh, was price. You know, we did a lot of listening a few years back, and what we heard from people was that we were a little bit out of whack when it, in the marketplace. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is that as we listened, people said we were too expensive. We did some listening internally, and what we found out was that um, we were, you know, scaring everybody away, telling them that our, we were charging $19.50, but we had so many discounts in the marketplace that at the end of the day, our average ticket price was under $12. And then the third thing we did was we hired uh, a, a local firm to do some very intentional listening to kind of find out with people on site, you know, what was that sweet spot for us. And the result of that was that we went from a tiered structure uh, down to a one price model. We got rid of all that and we said, okay, look, uh, if you're five and under, you get to come to the museum for free. Anyone else, we're going to charge $14.50 and we are going to be ruthless in eliminating those discounts and so forth. Uh, but again, this is an effort, as I remember when I was in my 20s, I was dirt poor. Uh, and so for a, a millennial audience, we thought that this made sense for them and sent a right message about wanting, you know, hearing what they were saying. Uh, we need the dollars. This is fuel for our mission. But at the same time, how could we meet them more than halfway in terms of accessibility? And the positive thing for the high was that the, and the result of that was actually that we saw our revenue uh, increase from emissions increase by about 20 percent or about $200,000 positive to budget last year. The third area is what I would call be an agent of change. Uh, you know, as you heard earlier, uh, millennials, young professionals, they want to be part of something that's bigger than themselves. They want, like every other generation that came before, and for those of you that are millennials, I, again, um, I regret to inform you, but you're completely average. Every other generation that came before uh, wants to make the, the world a better place. Uh, and and to this generation is no different than that. And I think one of the ways that the high has distinguished itself in terms of its pursuit of that is the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, collaboration is a super important component of who we are as an organization. Um, what's perhaps different for, for us is that we've really dedicated ourselves to saying, okay, we're going to reach out to the community. We're going to create the strategic partnerships, but only about 25% of those do we want to be with the usual suspects. In other words, the other cultural organizations. The other 75% of our energy, we want to focus on different nonprofit organizations. Because what we have found is that when you do that, uh, it challenges us to think about our mission in new and creative ways. But at the same time, it exposes us to different segments of our community than we ever would have had a chance to engage. So that's been particularly exciting for us. Um, 
The fourth thing that I would highlight uh, goes back to uh, that culture shock, Laplaca Cohen's, uh, not culture shock, culture track uh, report. Uh, you know, this is a generation, they're heat seekers, as they call them. They're very social, they want to be around things. And we've launched two programs in the last two years that I think have been successful. The first is our First Fridays program. Um, you know, a lot of places around the country will stay open late, spend some music, provide some food and drink. And we, before we really dove into this, we thought about it and we said, okay, we want to do that, but we always want to do something programmatic that's going to remind our audience that they're at a visual arts organization. Because as you heard earlier, um, you know, at a certain point, you can go eat, drink, and be merry with your friends at that new restaurant, that new bar, that new club, and so forth. And so we decided there that we would always have that component at the end that it tied it more directly to their experience with their institution. Uh, last year, as you can see, we averaged about 680 people every first Friday of the month. This year, we're averaging nearly 1,000 people. A second program that we launched last year was something called Highball. It's a craft cocktail competition. 16 mixologists uh, show up. They each create a signature cocktail. Uh, we, have, we cap it at about 500 people. We nearly sold out both of the last years. Super fun. Uh, but it's just a different way for us to provide a gateway for people to connect with the museum. And then the last thing that I would highlight is the fact that I think we have a tendency to forget that, you know, depending on which demographer you listen to, that the early end of the continuum with the, um, the millennials are now in their early to mid 30s. And those folks are, are creating families and so forth. And so at the high, we spent a lot of time focusing on engaging that family audience. And I think the one program that increasingly is a hallmark, not only of our, our family initiatives, but really the change relationship with, with, that we have with the community is our second Sunday's program. Uh, this is a day when we waive admission, our education department rallies, they create a series of hands-on, family-oriented, art-making activities for folks to do. Pre-program back in FY15, on any given Sunday, we averaged about 1,650 people. Uh, the first year that we did it, you see it jumped to over 2,300 people. The next year, last year, in fact, 2,700 people. The last quarter of last year, it jumped to 3,000 people. And this year, we're averaging over 5,000 people every second Sunday of the month. Um, every color of the rainbow, every walk of life, unbelievable energy on that day. And it's just been an extraordinary uh, way for us to connect with the community. Uh, the results have been super encouraging for us as an organization. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, again, inclusivity, we look at this a lot of different ways. By the way, all the numbers I'm going to share with you have been filtered for school tours. They are not included in these numbers. Uh, so one of the things that we really focused on was demographics by ethnicity. Uh, in the last two years, we've actually tripled it. Uh, we were about at 15% non-white participation. Last year, we hit 45%. This year, uh, we're trending at about 48% non-white participation at the museum. What's encouraging for us is that if if you compare, compare that to Metro Atlanta, which is 51% minority majority, you can see that we're rapidly approaching our goal of truly reflecting the audience that we serve. This gives you some indication of that rainbow of people that are coming to the museum. We pay attention to that as a staff. We learn what we can from it. But at the end of the day, this is really what that means. And this is a photograph taken from a recent Second Sunday. And I promise you, it is neither staged nor is it atypical of the audience that we get on this day. And in that one image, you can see African American, Asian American, I mean, Caucasian, I mean, you name it, all coming together to experience their art museum. Uh, that's why we, we do what we do. Uh, household income is something else we pay attention to. Last year, we were really encouraged to learn that 44% of the people that came to the museum had less than a bachelor's degree. That's a big deal in Atlanta. Uh, you are probably not aware, but unfortunately, the Brookings Institution has said that for the last two years in a row, Atlanta is the number one city in the country when it comes to income inequality. 44% came from households making less than $70,000 a year. That's why that Brookings Institution thing is so important. Sorry about that. 46% of, the, of those that came to the museum had less than a bachelor's degree. Uh, and you can see from this uh, that we've got a great range in terms of age coming to the museum. So we're really encouraged by that. And I think, especially at that lower end of that, you can see where our emphasis on families is really coming into play. And so the good thing for us is that the world's starting to pay attention. Um, I think we're trying very hard to be a place where our staff comes to work every day. We're building a culture where people come to the office and very intentionally ask themselves the question, you know, what is it that the high can do to change Atlanta? 
you know, what's our role in terms of that? And it's been really exciting for us. Um, and so it's, it's been affirming, but we still have a ton of work to do. But um, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about what we've been up to. That's on now. I'll let you pass it back. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I have some questions. Um, we're going to do a mic in a few minutes, but I, I wanted to kick it off a little bit um, with our panels, panelists. I had a bunch of questions, and as they talked, I scribbled them out and have new questions for you, so I'm going to spring them on you. Um, I want to start with Christine um, and maybe talk a little bit about Wallace. Um, I heard the phrase learning cycles, and I know that's really important for Wallace. Uh, and I think, is that one of your terms, maybe? And so can you talk a little bit about t um, applying that when folks go home? What, is that, what does that mean as far as their work? Yep, so that is one of the terms we use, and I think we've called it a lot of different things over time, actually, because we're a private foundation. We like to label things and cost stress to our organizations. Um, but the, the idea is, again, you're not going to get something right the first time. So um, start with what it is that you're trying to test or what, you're, what it is that you're trying to achieve, what's your problem that you're trying to solve. Um, build in that learning from the beginning. Do the test, the activity, the program, whatever it is. Measure and see, did it work the way that you thought it was going to work? Did you get better results or worse results? And why do you think that happened? And that's an important step. And then go back and think, okay, based on what you think worked or didn't work, what would you do differently and try again? So Wallace has called it continuous learning, a learning cycle. I come from a simpler world. I just call it test and learn. Um, and I like the slide that you had that showed pre-program and then how in one, like you did it over time, or the high did it over time, and in one year you almost doubled your attendance goal. And I think uh, what I took away from that is that the high did start something with a, with a pilot or a pre-program, and you just kept iterating, 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 and then you just saw that rapid growth, and now you're seeing um, just the constant, uh, constant success of that and the ongoing success of that. I was hoping what you saw was that that's a program you needed to fund, but anyways. <laughs> Now we know why Rand and all of us came to talk with Wallace. Uh, Mariana, I just want to ask you to, um, maybe going to our friend in the back with the 10 to 60 year olds, um, when you brought your slide up and talked about your approach to your audience, it was extremely well defined. 21 to 40 years old, some college education, et cetera. I remember when we did our study, Wallace encouraged us, we picked actual zip codes. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us about how you felt that target was, was important rather than, sorry, to, 10 to 60 is, <laughs> did, did that help or how did that inform your, your work? Yeah, I mean, I think we knew, um, we, we did want to engage millennials. Um, and then the fact that the population of New Orleans was so heavily African American and underrepresented in our institution, it just made sense to sort of combine those two demos together. Um, and then also the growing market around New Orleans, the job market around New Orleans, is, is, is it's, it's increasing. Um, there's, you know, a number of new developments and which will result in new jobs. And so this community is part of our, our, our neighborhood now. And so given, um, you know, the positioning of where the CAC is in the city and thinking about our neighborhood, um, these are going to be the people that are going to be frequenting our, our space. And so we wanted to be able to engage them now and not wait until after, you know, they've sort of populated the area to then begin that conversation and bringing them into dialogue with us. But it's interesting because you're, you're, with that sort of target demographic, I mean, you're, when you're looking at what their needs and wants are. I mean, you, someone's needs and wants as a young family is much different mm -hmm. than someone whose needs and wants are for, at, a, at a senior age. So you've got, you're, you're ta targeting it in and, and learning from that, that group you want to approach. Right. 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 That's good. Um, and you, I saw that you did a lot. You included some millennials in your planning. I wanted to ask Rand if you had millennials on a, a panel or on part of your planning or a curator. Or how, how did you involve, um, or, or in your community, it was more diverse in, this, in your sense. So how do you include that in the actual planning and execution of the work? Well, I think that our staff increasingly reflects the audience that we serve. I mean, we're, we're trying very hard to, to diversify our staff. We still have a lot of work to go there. But in terms of the, whether it's the family programming or the, the program that we're doing for young professionals and so forth, I mean, we have people that are in that target range that, you know, hopefully, as, as we heard earlier, are, they're, they're more than capable of understanding what their cohort 
wants to do and what's going to be exciting for them. Um, so that is part of our process. Great, great. Well, we heard a lot about successes. So before I turn it to the audience, I want to ask both of you, what hasn't worked? <laughs> it's not, it seems like great things, but maybe what, what could you learn from things that you tried and were difficult or you had to abandon or change course mid, midway? Is there some lessons from the painful battlefield you could share with us? Well, I, I would just speak broadly about, I think, the importance of um, remembering to, I mean, there's a tendency, as I think someone mentioned earlier, to kind of focus on one target audience. And at the high, I think that we don't focus on an audience as much as we focus on our audience, whatever that means. And the, the reminder of trying to bring everyone with you is an important one. I mean, for us, we've had a lot of change and I think uh, most people that look at our change in emphasis read that as a positive and read that as being about inclusion and they're excited about it. But we would be naive not to realize that there's a certain segment of our audience who looks at that change and interprets it as loss. Right, And they're trying to, and we've got to figure out, okay, they're asking themselves the question, what's in it for me? And so we have to make sure that if we're really committed to being a place where, as I said earlier, all of Atlanta is comfortable coming together, what are we doing for those folks as well? And ultimately, how do we build the kind of credibility with our audience across the board that regardless of what we do, they're true fans of the museum. And so whether they see something and they may think, well, that's not for me, but the tr truth of it is that the last three times I went to the museum and you know they killed it, so I'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt and I'm gonna go and experience it. I mean, that's the ultimate goal for us, is how do we get that credibility? Mary Ellen? Um, <clears throat> so I think going into the project, I think we made some very uh, big assumptions about this target demographic. I think we thought that um, we were doing the work already and they hadn't gotten word of it. Um, and that if we uh, sort of amplify it, they'll come. Um, but we didn't really think about the work it takes to really get them through the doors. So there are things that were in the way even before someone stepped foot into our, into our space. So things like, you know, Christine mentioned this earlier about what are the things that we're competing for. So in New Orleans, you know, a lot of entertainment is free. So the idea that they have to pay to get into our space, parking, um, people have families. Um, where we are in the city isn't really accessible without a car, a vehicle. Um, and so we, we believe that, um, you know, once they heard about our wonderful and dynamic programs, and of course, we'll just, we'll get them all in here. But no, we needed to think about, so what times are we having performances? So thinking about after parking becomes free. Thinking about, um, so how do you make a night out in a, in, in a part of the city where there's not really a lot of restaurants or places to sort of, um, you know, uh, unload once you're, you're finished with the performance. So thinking about all the things that actually inform them coming into our space, um, we, we, we thought about that in a, in a space of naiveness and, and naivete and, and not really considering the work it takes before they even acknowledge or even see the work that we're putting in place. Can I please, add just please, a couple. one more, um, please. I'm glad that uh, Mariana and CAC was uh, very intentional about being very clear and defining your target audience because um, one of the organizations that we're funding in terms of what hasn't worked for them and a failure, they assumed that if they attracted a millennial audience because millennials have more racial and ethnic diversity, that their organization would naturally increase in the racial and ethnic diversity of their audience as well. And that was not the case. They just got more younger white people. And they were really upset to find out um, just because you get younger people, you don't automatically get um, more diversity in race and ethnicity. So they're really struggling through that right now and asking for their organization, what if they have, not that you have to pick between one or the other, but um, where, where's really the importance for their focus? Where would they really focus on today? Um, and I think also in terms of what doesn't work is some of the organizations created a gateway experience specifically to draw in millennials. So like a smaller version of a concert series paired with an indie pop band um, to try to bring in millennials, hoping that that will attract millennials to the organization and the millennials will come back to what they normally program on the main season. Um, and what they're finding is uh, that's not the case. And I think that's really causing, um, there's no answer to it yet, because again, that answer is what's right for that organization in that context, where they're thinking, 
is this what's going to draw the millennials? And if so, do we want to create this another product line and keep this going because that's what attracting millennials? Or do we want to keep figuring out a way how to get attract millennials with this first offering and get them to cross over into something else? Great. Um, I want to give a quick round of applause to our, our panelists here. Thank you.